Hey there, welcome back to Mastering Thought. My name is Christina Black, and I'm here with my friend, Dr. Mark Waller. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. Good. So today, Mark is going to take us on the next leg of the journey after your awakening, and I'm just going to be as surprised as all of you to see what he has to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, let me let me just say a little thing in introduction here. I was talking to my friend about this, a friend of mine, about this presentation this weekend, <clears throat> and I suddenly realized that there's a there's a thing that I introduce in this program today mm -hmm. that I don't believe anybody else in psychology or counseling or or anything has ever considered before. It's a brand new concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, but I think when I present it, it's going to make so much sense. Why wouldn't anybody have ever thought of this before? <clears throat> so, um, yeah, well, so we'll just kind of launch into it. And in order to facilitate this, I have uh, created this um, fictional character named Nancy. Fictional? Mm -hmm. Fictional. So this is this is kind of uh, the working title is how to process your past without getting sucked back in. So mm, good title. Yeah, I think one good of the title. one of the things that people worry about when they come to counseling is that they're going to have to go relive the past, and they don't want to relive yeah. the past. And right. actually, it's, it's not necessary. <laughs> mm -hmm. So here is our hypothetical person named Nancy. And okay. um, here are a couple facts about her. Uh, she's very much a hard charger, an achiever. She's a top, or at least she was when she was in her 20s, a top athlete. Um, right now, she's in her mid-30s, very successful businesswoman. Um, mm -hmm. She's also a spiritual seeker. Mm -hmm. And... Um, she and I had an encounter several years ago. She did the thought watching and she had a tremendous awakening. Mm -hmm. Completely changed her life. Hmm. Now, another important aspect of her life that comes into play here is she was raised by a single parent. Mm -hmm. And so here's her father. She was raised by her father. And you can see in this picture, her father is just a little on the stern side. <clears throat> And she yeah. is a little awestruck. I don't know if you could pick that up in her expression. Mm -hmm. Did I do a good job with that? I think so. And I like that she's mimicking him. Like she's learning from him. She's kind of, I'm guessing, like trying to trying to take his view of life as she considers her own. Right. And so she, you know, she very much grew up um, focused on that relationship. And we'll get in, mm -hmm. in, into that in a, in a moment here. So anyway, this is Nancy, our hypothetical client that we're going to talk about today. Her awakening, her life moved forward, and she met somebody and became engaged. Mm -hmm. And so our story kind of picks up here where when they moved in together, something strange started to happen. Hmm. And this is where it gets kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if you've had this experience before, even in your own life, but you know, when you meet and fall in love and everything's, you know, uh, really fantastic. And then you move in together and then some subtle things start to happening. Like you realize you don't like the way he brushes his teeth and, you know, <laughs> why, why, why the hell did she sleep so late on Saturday morning? You know, all these things right. start to happen. Yeah. Well, well, that that's what happened. There, there were three distinct things uh, that she noticed, and they were emotional reactions that she was having. Mm -hmm. And the number one reaction she reports is that she felt like her boyfriend or her fiance was disgusted with her at times. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and here he is, and he's supposed to just a mild look of disgust. So at the same time, she was like moving forward with wanting to marry this man who was agreeing to marry her. But at the same time, she also felt like he disgusted her. 
or I'm sorry, that she disgusted him. Her interpretation of his reaction was that he was disgusted by her at times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, the next reaction she noticed was that she felt sometimes that she was a burden to him. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And here she is feeling like she's a burden. And this, these, these reactions shocked her. She didn't know where they were coming from because the relationship had been so good. Mm-hmm. And finally, she noticed she had one other reaction. <clears throat> and that was whenever he would become upset, she would panic. Hmm. And um, we'll find out why she would. Well, basically her interpretation was, when he was upset, he was going to leave her. Got it. So that's why she would panic. Yeah, so she would panic. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to go into the part of the brain that processes this stuff and gives us emotional reactions. Yeah. And this is where we want to introduce the uh, lion and unicorn model of, of, um, let me just, oh, here's, here's the limbic system. All of these emotional reactions come from the limbic system, which you can see here is the basal ganglia, thalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, and uh, hypothalamus. And the amygdala, this green thing right here Mm -hmm. in the middle, that is where fight or flight comes from. So that's what's being activated. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's where these emotional um, things come from. And it's basically coming from the limbic system, which is fight or flight, anger, fear. It's all about survival because it's the part of the brain we share with other animals. And this right. is a key concept that comes up over and over again. The limbic system's completely wired up by the time you're five years of age. Right. Now, this this is really a big fact in how all of this works. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's go to this slide here, and we'll see, well, this is the cognitive, this is the cognitive process that goes on in the limbic system. Mm-hmm. Perception, and believe it or not, we get our perception in the limbic system. Mm-hmm. So basically our perception of what's happening or the way we make meaning out of our experiences is coming from through the eyes of a five-year-old child. Right. Yeah. So when we get emotional, we, we actually decrease the age that we're allowed to, or we're able to act that, that maturity level at, right? Well, see, this is one of the big ideas here in this, in this program today is that when the limbic system is triggered, the limbic system stops development by the time you're five years of age, roughly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so basically, a five-year-old is in charge. Every time you go into fight or flight, it's like Every a time you go into fight or flight. Uh-huh. Right. So perception triggers feelings. Mm-hmm. And we don't like those feelings, so we have a defense that we use. And that defensive behavior makes is intended to make the feelings go away. Mm-hmm. And then they have a goal. All, all, uh, and all goal-directed, and this is another big idea, all goal-directed intentional behavior comes from the limbic system. And this comes okay. right out of research. Mm-hmm. So in other words, this this shirt I'm wearing right here you know, I basically bought this to enhance my survival. Uh huh. So the limbic system th- saw this shirt and said, "Nice shirt." Yeah. And and so the limbic system goes to the cortex and says, "I want to buy that shirt." And the cortex says, "Cortex says, sounds good to me. Let's carry out that." Yeah, let's goal. get warm. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's that's how this works. Mm-hmm. And so um, this is where this cognitive process comes from. 
So goal-directed behavior starts in the limbic system. Okay. And this is, uh, this is, I got this out of research from um, Berkeley, where they disconnected the limbic systems of chickens. And once there was no limbic system connected, there was no purposeful, purposeful behavior anymore. So it didn't kill them, but it completely changed their behavior. Yeah, there was just random pecking and stuff, but there was no goal-directed purposeful behavior at that point. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Now, this is really scary when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm a therapist, and I've got a couple sitting in front of me, and that behavior I'm watching is being directed by the five-year-old emotional brain. Mm-hmm. And they are not aware of that. It's a huge right. concept. Right. Okay, so here's another problem. Take a look at this. So when Nancy is looking at her fiancé, and here he is on the left, her limbic system is actually seeing her father, who is on the right. After they moved in together. After they moved in together. So right. people ask me ask me all the time, what changed? We didn't have this pattern before when we were dating. So what happens is the closer we get emotionally to someone, the more likely it is that they remind us of the parent where our issues come from. Mm. It's almost like um, once you reach a certain level of intimacy, you, your brain accepts that that person is part of your survival and it just ties it back to something it once knew. Yeah. Yes. And so let me think about it in another way. When we're little kids, we develop a template for what a relationship looks like. Right. And that template comes with our, from our relationship with a key figure, either usually either our mother or our father. Uh-huh. Now, like when we primary. grow up, the limbic system is still using that template for a relationship. And so at some point, a switch gets thrown and the limbic system says, oh, there's dad or there's mom. Got it. And this so is the big concept I was... Dad. Go ahead. Oh, I'm saying, so she started to see him as dad. That's exactly right. And those freak outs that she was experiencing or, or like surprising, you know, disappointments are, are maybe some things that she was feeling, you know, when she was five or younger. Right. Mm. Now this, this, now we're going to get into this some more because this is this, this is the birth of the cycle in the relationship because, okay. because Nancy is seeing her father. She starts responding as if he is her father. That triggers him to see her like the parent where that he used to form his template. And it starts the cycle that we've talked about before called the dance of the lion and the unicorn. Hmm. Well, and golly, if he's getting thrown into some, some version of fight or flight as well, then we have two people working with a five-year-old emotional brain and you can see how problems would perpetuate. You wouldn't expect two five-year-olds to stop a struggle that they had together on their own necessarily. Interesting. Okay. So we got to get our adult brain involved, huh? It's that's, that's where we're going with this. Yeah. Okay. So what's happening here so far is everything was great. We met, we fell in love. Those people are still available. But what's happened now is we have this case of mistaken identity going on because the limbic system is identifying this other person as the parent. Mm -hmm. And so all the survival uh, uh, instincts we learned as little kids now have come into play and we're responding to those perceptions instead of reality that's staring Mm -hmm. us in the space. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, we have Nancy thinking he's disgusted, thinking that she's a burden. And, and when he gets upset, panicking, um, that he might leave altogether. Now, now let me explain why this is so important. As we said earlier, Nancy is being raised by, was raised by a single parent. 
Mm-hmm. So the bottom so line, if he went away. Yeah, that's right. He would, she would have no one. Uh huh. And that's scary. And so she's looking at him being upset, believing he's her father who is going to leave and because he's the last parent available Mm -hmm. and she's Mm -hmm. going to be completely abandoned. Mm. Okay. Now, now, as you said just a minute ago, we got to find a way out of this, right? Yeah. We can't let the five-year-olds run the house. (laughs) So let's take a look (laughs) at the, at the five-year-olds for a second through this lens of uh, the lion and the unicorn. Okay. Now, if you if you understand the lion and unicorn model, you you can almost immediately detect whether somebody is a lion or a unicorn. Right. So, if we plug in Nancy's perceptions about being a burden and being, you know, his being disgusted with her, those are both forms of rejection, aren't they? Yeah. And so that perception of being rejected is going to trigger a feeling that nobody cares or you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And then typically people, their defensive behavior, if they're a lion, is going to be anger. Mm -hmm. And the goal of this whole system here is approval. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we were to talk to... Nancy, it would become very apparent that her goal is to get approval from her partner so she doesn't Mm -hmm. get rejected. Mm -hmm. So remember, her perception is she's a burden. He's disgusted with her. But let's look at the unicorn's cognitive process. Okay. The unicorn's perception is there's going to be, they hate conflict. Unicorns don't like conflict. Mm Mm-hmm. They feel like there's going to be conflict or they're going to be in trouble. And that produces feelings of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And you know this, we've talked about this before. So the defensive behavior is to avoid the conflict. Right. To try to make the fear or the anxiety go away. That's their, what they naturally think is the best response to calm the situation down. Right. It's fight versus flight. This is a form of flight. Right. And their goal is safety. Mm -hmm. So what she's interpreting as disgust or being a burden is really his struggle with his feelings around anxiety and trying to avoid having an ordeal. Mm -hmm. So he's in his head thinking, oh my God, here we go again. How do I solve this problem? I don't want to have a fight. And he's doing all these strategizing, you know, in his head from his uh, childhood and to Nancy watching him have that limbic struggle on his side makes it look like she's being rejected when in fact, that's not what is happening. She's misunderstanding him, but she sees it as a rejection. Right. Yeah. I've lived that before. (laughs) (laughs) And this, and this eventually leads to the dance of the lion and the unicorn where anger looks like conflict and avoidance looks like rejection. And it just goes around and around Mm -hmm. like that. Just makes a mess over your feelings. (laughs) (laughs) So what do we, what do we do about this? Well, I already know, but if you want to keep the drama, I think you should tell. (laughs) You go ahead. (laughs) Well, at some point, somebody's going to have to have an awareness of the cycle and hopefully both partners and that they can begin to understand each other so that they both feel a little safer and accepted and can actually hear each other. But also, um, it's not going to work if Nancy's not aware that she's hallucinating her dad on top of her fiance. Right. And same for her fiance. You know, I really like the way you put that using the word hallucination, because that's literally what's happening. Yeah. Now now the person's not aware that they're hallucinating a parent. Right. But they're they're responding to the hallucination. Right. And they don't realize it. 
Yeah, it's it sounds like um, something they've known for so long that why would you question it? It's just a part of you, right? It, it, exactly, right. It feels yeah, like... Yeah, it's a given. This is how yeah, I am. Exactly. But it yeah. doesn't have to be how you are. Stay <laughs> tuned. <laughs> so, now you, you put your finger on it. So the idea here now is to use... I'm just using the word active self-awareness. So the problem mm -hmm. is how to keep the limbic system from hijacking perception. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a better way to say it would be how to become aware that the limbic system has hijacked your perception. Mm. Now, the key to this is it has to happen in the moment. Right. We have to be so able to see it in the, the moment. Loop. Yeah. At some point, right? It can stop even if you started the loop, but you can also sometimes avoid the loop. Well, the aha moment comes by seeing what, what's happening in the moment it's happening. Mm-hmm. So how do we do this? Well, I've got a little easy way of doing this. And so let's go back to Nancy. And what we're going to do is we're going to have every time she has an emotional reaction. We're going to have her reflect on that emotional reaction. Now, this becomes mm -hmm. very simple. Why is that? Because we've already established Nancy as a lion, so we know this is some form of rejection. Mm -hmm. we, 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 and this is, you know, in real practice, this is so simple because, you know, when, let's say I'm interviewing a couple or I'm interviewing a person and, and I, mm -hmm. I, I have a suspicion, okay, you're a lion. Or you, mm -hmm. you're a unicorn. I'll just ask them a simple question. Since lions want approval and unicorns want safety and they don't like conflict, I'll, if, it's a, if it's a lion, I say, you know, when you think about your childhood, was, a, was there a parent you wanted more acceptance from? Mm. Or you felt maybe a little rejected, you, like you would have liked more acknowledgement. And 99% of people know immediately who that parent is. Mm. And they'll just say, oh, oh, it's dad. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. So you're saying if you ask a lion, who did they want more acceptance from, they can answer immediately? Is that immediately. what you mean? Immediately. Yeah. And I, I mean, I could too, to be honest. So, right. yeah. You know, the question I'll ask a unicorn is when you think about your childhood, you know, which parent do you, would you think was more involved in pressure and control and conflict? And I will mm -hmm. immediately get an answer. Immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'll say, right. well, why do you say that? And we'll, you know, nail it down a little better. So, right. And this is, this is why the lion and unicorn model is so powerful. Because I know if they're a lion or a unicorn, what the right question to ask is. Yeah. And they know what the right answer is because we're using this roadmap. Mm-hmm. And you know what's what's funny is um I acknowledge that you know if I was a unicorn I'd be able to tell you which parent like pr pressured me or pushed me encouraged me to keep going keep going but I can also tell you I had no problem with that. I mean, you know, in the moments maybe sometimes it was annoying, but that's not the thing I hang on to. The thing that I've had to learn to let go of was the parent who I didn't feel like accepted me as much. Exactly. And, and see so what you, it's kind of interesting. Well, what you learn is that unicorns do not like to be pressured and controlled. They don't like to be told what to do. And they mm -hmm. really do not like conflict. Mm -hmm. And so there's more layers to this. But having that roadmap to look at uh, makes it really easy to figure out how to ask the question. Mm -hmm. And so here we are now, we've got Nancy. Now she might reflect on this the day after. Let's say, mm -hmm. you know, Friday night, you know, she and her boyfriend had a bit of an argument and she doesn't mm -hmm. remember to process this until the following day. Okay. And so my, my instruction to her would be, okay, if you, as soon as you remember, just reflect back on it and ask yourself, the following question. How is this related to my father? Mm -hmm. 
And then don't try to answer the question. Yeah. We don't want to analyze. We just want to prompt our non-conscious mind with the question and leave it hanging in the air. Mm-hmm. I feel like I even uh, have to invite my creative mind to just take a break for a moment. Like, hey, yeah. I yeah. love what you do for me, creative mind, but if we could just let the non-conscious answer right now, that would be really great. <laughs> this is hard for people because they want to struggle to search for an answer, and they actually mm-hmm. don't have to. The struggle, right. the struggle to search for the answer prolongs the journey to find the answer. And, you know, I mean, people are having to get to kind of root causes in, in bodywork sessions with me for things. And, um, you know, I think the biggest problem is people have a difficult time trusting what the deepest voice in them says because it's more of a unique circumstance than how we typically think. Well, we're not used to doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're it's used a to totally figuring things out. kind of way of thinking. Yeah, for sure. And to kick back and have the answers float up, is that like is that too good to be true? But it's it's not. Our <laughs> well, bodies but, and brains want to heal. So so all she has to do is ask this question, how's this related to my father, and then let it go. Now, mm-hmm. my experience with this is that eventually that time frame, that lag, gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And in a very right. in a very quick period of time, there's a moment where she's, she's feeling like she's a burden, you know, her, she's being rejected, whatever. And she's literally asking the question about her father in the midst of that interaction. And it comes to her mm-hmm. and she immediately saying, Oh my God, I'm responding to my father. I'm not responding to him. And when that goes away, she takes another look at him and realizes this is not what I thought it was at all. Mm-hmm. And now, now the healing basically has occurred because we're no longer applying the past to the present anymore. And now we're free of it. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then the next time I, you get in an argument, the same thing happens and you're rewiring the system over and over again. And you're in, in a very short period of time, you're completely free of it. Right. Yeah. And it's just that easy. So just in the moment when you start to feel um, either that you know uh, something that's going to trigger you is coming up, you know you're going to have a conversation that might trigger you, or you find yourself in it and you see yourself beginning to go into fight or flight, just keep it really simple and go, how is this relating to my primary relationship as a child? So how does this relate to mom? How does this relate to dad? And then the better, the more you practice that, the quicker the answers come. Right. And you can step out in the moment that you break the hallucination by realizing you're reacting to something else and not in the moment. Uh, I really like the way you said that because that's exactly happened. You're interacting with this person and you suddenly see because of your Mm self-awareness that you're hallucinating a parent and you're responding to that instead. And the moment Mm -hmm. you see it, the spell is broken. Right. Literally forever. Right. Right. You're no longer the five-year-old. Right. You're also aware of how that pattern would happen and maybe gives you a second chance to really observe your partner and respond to the true situation in front of you. That's right. Yeah. Which would be more effective anyway. (laughs) Well, yeah. Because the other isn't effective at all. (laughs) At all. Yeah. The other one keeps fights going for years. So this is how to heal the past without reliving the past. Okay. Just that process you mean, or this next part? No, just that, just that process. That's how you do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just calling out the hallucination. And you know, when you see it happening, when you see your brain literally hijacking your experience, it's an experience like none other. Because Just it's an in the aha of moment the games that you don't want, mm-hmm. and oftentimes mm-hmm. what will happen, sense. I've I've seen this over and over again. In the moment, the person sees it, they laugh and they cry at the same time. Mm-hmm. They're just so relieved, but also all that frustration that they've had, or well, whatever negative feelings. Well, the pain is coming up, mm-hmm. but. 
they're suddenly seeing how ridiculous the whole system has become because it's not true. None of it's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so they're laughing at the, how ridiculous they've made it, but the feelings have come up, so they're crying, and it's, it's an interesting experience to watch people go through. Mm, so cool. And one, one more thing to plug into that for people who are pretty sensitive and aware of their body, that's called a somatic emotional release. And you might even notice um, actual tension in your body relieving um, at the moment and shortly after having that awareness and uh, um, breaking that spell. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've had some pretty insane ones, so I thought I'd share. <laughs> If your body hurts, maybe you have some mind work to do. <laughs> so why don't you uh, tell our friends what we'd like them to do, what our invitation is. Sure. So we're so glad you joined us today. We'd love you to stick around. Hit subscribe. Like the video, please. <laughs> and if you have any friends you're journeying with or family members or people that you share, um, you know, this topic with, please go ahead and send them one of our videos. We have a heart to um, uh, just see people have these tools in their hands and not be so subject to um, the mind as they had been using it. We want to improve um, your emotions, your mind, your relationships, and go ahead and leave us a comment. Write us an email. If you have ideas, questions, thoughts you want to share, if you'd like to be on the show with us. Um, we don't do therapy, but we do teach uh, practical tools so that you can um, just have a better, better experience in your day-to-day -day and in your relationships. So, yeah. And in the meantime, feel free to check out one of my books. As mm -hmm. I said before, The Dance, the Lion, and the Unicorn, which has a lot to do with today's uh, presentation. Mastering Thought is about the awakening that makes this all so much easier. I really mm -hmm. kind of forgot to mention that because when you get separate from the voice in your head and you realize that's not who you are anymore, seeing this other stuff happening is just automatic. Right. Yeah. You know, it just happens automatically. Well, I love how you put it. It changes your entire relationship to all thought. Right. And um, I was explaining it to a friend, and it's like, you know how it's really easy to see what other people's issues are? Well, they could just get their act together if they did this, this, and that. But you have a blind spot for yourself. Well, this allows you to have a you know, third party view of yourself. You can step outside of yourself and look at what's going on as if you were somebody else, only you can actually do something about it. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. I really like the way you said that because it does give you a third party view of yourself. Yeah. You know, when you're in the bubble of the limbic system, you can't see it. Right. But when you're outside of it, it's right there. You can see it immediately. Yeah, and actually that's an interesting point because like you were talking before in a different episode with speech bubbles before the limbic system's done developing, kids can't even really have too many private thoughts. They like have to speak everything out. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I don't remember <laughs> if I tied it together, but the <laughs> but anyway. One more thing, yeah. uh, the Dance of the Lion Unicorn is now in an audible book form. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you look it up on Amazon, there's a link there to take you to Audible to check that out. Mm -hmm. And here are I like our to do emails. That. What's that? Oh, my husband and I like to do that. If there's books we're trying to learn from, we buy the paper and Audible. And we'll read the paper oh. and listen to the Audible. And it just really drives in whatever. If we're really trying to wrap our head around a concept or really invest in um, in that process, then it's been really pretty helpful too. Well, look, thanks so much for um, helping draw this all out of me. And, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really think your comments today were right on target. You have, you have a, um, a fresh perspective on how to explain this in words that I don't normally use. And they're usually right on target and, and much, uh, very descriptive. Well, thank you. And it's pretty easy to do when you when you explain things so clearly. So, thanks. All right. Well, we'll wish everybody happy viewing. 
Yes, please let us know about your successes this week. Please let us know if you're thought watching. We are rooting for you. Team Mastering Thought. Okay, we'll see you next time. <laughs> All right, bye.